Hello, everybody. Hi. It's an honor to be here again. And it's good evening for those who are in Ireland and good afternoon for those who are in, in, in America. And uh, it's a pleasure because we are opening the bridge between USA and Ireland. And uh, it's an honor again to uh, host today our friend Julio, Julio Carvalho. He's a spiritist worker from New Jersey, and he will talk to us um, about the topic, the process, uh, the process. One second, let me get it here, because I, okay. Uh, the powerlessness of victims. So it's a very interesting topic considered to our, uh, nowadays, so, um, before I, uh, I, I give the word to, to Julio, I would like to invite everyone to do our initial prayer. So um, I just say to you, if you're listening in your car, if you are listening from your computer, just slow down. Raise up your thoughts towards Jesus, towards our mentors. Ask them to, to stay with us. To the mentors of the group, the, the SSI, who helped Julio today in his, his talk. May this prayer reach out to those hearts who are desperate, those hearts who are sick, those hearts who are hopeless. And may this, this talk today reach those ones who need to listen to the message. So, thank you. So, Julie, welcome to the British, to the bridge, not the British, the bridge, uh, Ireland and USA. So, thanks so much. Uh, um, Julia, the first time we met was in Mexico, isn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the, the uh, World Congress, uh, Speeches Congress in, in Mexico. Very good, my friend, very good. So, Julio, uh, I'll give the word to you. I stay just behind the scenes. If you need me, let me know. Once you finish your explanation, we can talk to everybody and say what's answer some questions uh, at the same time listen what they have to say to us and we can comment we can we can deep dive a little bit more in the spiritism philosophy okay okay julio thank you very much i'm going down here first of all i want to Thank you so much, and we'll do our best to meet your expectation, my friend Stephen. I'd like to start by um, justifying the way I speak. I worked in the jail system for 12 years, and most of the uh, inmates I worked with, unfortunately, they did not finish a high school. And as a result, whenever I spoke with them, whenever I've conducted our classes, I spoke in a manner that obviously was comprehensible to them. And I sort of developed an addiction to break things uh, into very small pieces. And since I don't know what you know, I, I will talk that way not because I have an intention to patronize you, uh, but rather because I don't know what you know. So please uh, accept my apologies in advance. My intention is not to offend you, not to belittle you, but to give a full explanation of what, what I'm trying to convey through this message. 
I would also like to say that please do not believe in my word that I will say. Once again, do not believe in the word that I say. In this philosophy, the spiritist philosophy, we're not supposed to accept what people say without any further thought. I will present you the material and it's up to you to ponder this material and make your own reflection on it. If you have studied, if you have given yourself the pleasure of reading this incomparable book, The Spirit's Book, one of the uh, main ways of analyzing this book, according to Alain Kardec himself, it's not to accept what is written, but rather to arrive at your own conclusions of what you're reading. So please do not accept or believe a word that I say, but rather think about it, analyze it. Whenever we are in pain, whenever we are in trouble, usually uh, the majority of people like to take a stance, like to see themselves through a particular lens. And that lens is of a victim. So I will share my screen in order for you to follow my train of thought. And that way we'll be able to keep track of my explanation here. We usually like to see ourselves as being a victim. And by definition, what is a victim? A victim is someone who suffered some sort of uh, trauma from someone else. So I, the victim, I blame someone for my unhappiness, for my pain. And this person could be my ex-boss, my ex-wife, my enemy, my in-laws, you know, mother-in-law, brother-in-law. So I see that the source of my pain is someone on the outside of my realm, of my reality. It's, it's someone that I point my finger to and I blame that person for causing my unhappiness, for causing my pain. So it's clearly that the cause of my problem lies on the outside because these individuals, they are not part of me. Uh, probably they share their lives with me, but they are not me, they're not uh, I. They are a different individual. So I blame them for causing my pain. Now, what is the problem with this picture? Well, the problem with this picture is that every victim is powerless. There is no such a thing as a strong victim. If an individual believes that they are a victim, they also assume to be powerless. That's the position they place themselves in. Now, why is that? Why is it that a victim is at the same time powerless? Well, if I blame someone for being the cause of my problem, if I blame my ex-boss, my ex-wife, an enemy, uh, an in-laws, my neighbor, whoever this person is, this person is the cause of my problem. And by definition, this person now becomes the solution to my problem. How come? Well, if I blame my ex-boss for being the cause of my pain, in order for my life to get better, I'm expecting this person to change. Remember, wherever we see the cause of the problem is also where we see the solution to the problem. Let's say your car breaks down. And if you look for the cause of your problem, and if you find the cause of a problem, you're going to fix it. So if the cause of your car problem is the uh, alternator, what is the solution? To change the alternator. 
If I find that the cause of my car problem is the alternator and I keep changing the battery or I keep changing the transmission of the car, it would definitely not get fixed. So wherever we find the cause of the problem is also where we see the solution to the problem. If you speak with any medical personnel, one of the most important aspects of disease and health, it's actually to give a right diagnosis. The correct diagnosis will lead the physician, will lead the scientist to search for the solution. So it is of a paramount importance that we understand that where we find the cause of the problem, that will lead us to the solution. So if I'm in pain, if I'm in trouble, if I find that my ex-wife is the cause of my pain, I am automatically seeing that she's also the solution to my problem. I'm actually expecting this person to change in order for my life to improve. And that will not happen. And uh, do you know why? Well, people do change, but they don't change for you. If I expect someone to change and they don't change, on top of that, I create anxiety. People do change, but they would not change for you. So if I blame my ex-boss, my ex-wife, an enemy for the cause of my pain, psychologically speaking, I'm assuming that these people will change in order for my life to improve. And since that will not happen, all I'm doing, I will prolong my misery. And in the process of prolonging my misery, I will be creating anxiety. And what is anxiety again? Anxiety is when you expect something to change, but then it doesn't. That's what anxiety is. And what is the effect of anxiety on us. The more anxious I feel, the slower the sensation of time increases. For example, if I'm in pain, if I'm miserable, an hour seems to me like three hours. A day seems to me like three days. Now, all of us have waited for someone at the airport. And when you go get someone at the airport, you're waiting for this person. You actually arrive there a little bit early. And if this is someone that you truly care about, if someone that you love and you're missing, and you get there at the airport, you know, an hour before the airplane actually touches down, that hour of your waiting seems to be a little bit longer than just an hour. Let's say you are in love with someone. And, you know, after... Uh, a year of relationship, this person comes to you and says, you know, I am sorry, uh, I have to let you go for approximately three months. You know, my job requires me that I have to go overseas and uh, we'll be in touch and I love you. And uh, this person flies away. You know, within a month and a half, you know, they, they call you and they say, listen, uh, something came up and they actually gave me a five days uh, of rest. So I'm going to see you. So wait for me at the airport. The airplane will arrive at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So now you're so anxious that this person will arrive at eight o'clock in the morning that you get there, not eight o'clock, but actually six o'clock. You want to see this person badly. But then, you know, those two hours, they feel so long. And, and while you're watching the monitor, it says, Flight delayed. So instead of eight o'clock, they will now get here. They will now will get here at eleven o'clock. So now you have to wait an additional three hours. And those additional three hours, they seem forever. So when that person finally arrives, you kiss them, you hug them, you go home, and they have all the fun in the world. But since they only have five days to be with you those five days fly really fast. And now they have to go back to the country where they came from 
and now you're lonely again. And why are you driving yourself back from the airport after dropping them off? You know, you keep thinking to yourself, did those five days really occur? It, they seem so fast. If you actually compare how you felt emotionally when you're waiting for them at the airport, when the airplane was delayed, versus the time you spent with them, those five days, it seems that those five days were much quicker than the additional three hours that you waited for them at the airport. How come? Your watch never went any faster, never went any slower. You're, the pointer on your watch kept going around the same speed. Sensation of time. So a victim blames everyone. A victim expects everyone to change. A victim sometimes expects the past to change, but that would not change. In the process of waiting for unchangeable people to change, they create anxiety. And anxiety changes our sensation of time. So not only we are feeling miserable, but we have a sensation that our misery is prolonged than actually it is. So this description of being the victim begs the question, why people choose to be victims? What is it to gain from being a victim? If there is so much suffering in being a victim, why do people choose this stance? Well, the answer is quite easy. They choose this position because being a victim is effortless. It's so easy to be a victim. All we have to do to be a victim is to have our index finger working and we'll point fingers at people. You know, you did this to me and you did that to me and I'm feeling this way because of you. That's why people choose to be a victim. There's nothing else for one to do except point fingers at people. When someone gives themselves the pleasure, when they use their wisdom to actually uh, find this knowledge, this body of knowledge called the uh, spiritist philosophy, something amazing changes. What changes, it's our perception of things. Perception dictates the way we think, the way we feel. It creates our actions, our habits, our character, our destiny. Our perception changes everything. There is a, th there is a third book. The third book written, organized, compiled, by Alan Kardec. It's a book entitled The Gospel According to Spiritism. And in this book, uh, chapter one, there is a subtitle called The Point of View. And what is a point of view? Well, a point of view is a view of a point. If you are standing in a room, each individual is standing in the room, they have a view of that particular point. And depending on where you're standing in the room, you could be seeing the same things other people are seeing it, but from a completely different perspective. And why? Because your view is from a different point than others in the room. And so it goes with life. The way you see yourself, the way you see challenges, the way you see how you face the biggest problems that you might have, it shapes if you're going to actually overcome the challenge or actually make that challenge even worse. And what one finds out after working with individuals that are in the jail system, is that most of these individuals who were there, they were there because they had a problem. 
if you think you have problems because problems are natural part of our lives. They are challenges that we must overcome. But what happened with most of those individuals is that they allowed despair to take over. And in the process of despair, they made a bigger problem than the original one. What is despair? Well, in order to comprehend despair, one can talk about uh, faith. One can talk about hope. You know, what is faith? What is one aspect or one of the definitions of faith? Well, faith, or we can uh, use its synonym here, hope, it's the certainty that my tomorrow would actually be better than today. If I have a certainty that my tomorrow will be better than today, then whatever I'm facing today, I will be able to overcome. Because just the matter that I have the certainty that my tomorrow will be better than today, that gives me resilience. It gives me strength in order to overcome today's challenge. Now, what is despair? instead. Despair is when I have the certainty that my tomorrow will be worse than today. It's when I think that things is going to get worse and not better. And as a result, whatever problem I'm facing today, I'll actually make it bigger than the original problem itself. So those individuals, unfortunately, they allow themselves to be in a state of despair and cause the problem. I'll give you uh, one tiny example of this process. I remember this story very vividly because it was a story about this young girl. She was 19 years old, beautiful girl. And uh, she went out with her boyfriend for the entire high school year. You know, four years of high school here in the U.S. And when they finished high school, he came up to her and said, you know, now we're heading to college and I would like to be with other people. You know, I love you, but I want to be in other relationships. I believe I'm too young just to be committed to you. So it's time for us to move on. Obviously, she was brokenhearted. And because she thought that her tomorrow will be better, will be worse than today. Because she th had this certainty, you know, I would not be able to exist without him. She went ahead to a liquor store, bought a bottle of vodka, I drove her car to a near park, and there she started drinking. And she told me vividly that she uh, was looking for songs in order to drink uh, the alcohol. And it's an interesting thing that whenever you're looking to be miserable, you actually find the songs to make you even more miserable. <laughs> it's, it's a compound effect. So she says she got even more sad while she was drinking, drinking and listening to that song. And then after she was fully intoxicated, she put her card on reverse, ran over something, did not feel a thing because she was too, too drunk to notice. Then she went home. Two hours later, the cops showed up and took her in. And now she was in jail. Did she care? Of course not. She was still intoxicated. The alcohol took from her discernment. What is discernment? It's our ability to distinguish right from wrong. And that's the problem here with drinking in excess. One loses our discernment. So she could care less if she was in jail or not. But on the following day, when she woke up, then she noticed where she was, in jail. And I'm the one who had to tell her that she had killed the son of the judge of the city she lived in. This lady got 17 years 
in prison. I'm sorry, 23 years in prison. Because I remember speaking with her and telling um, how awful she felt that she would be leaving prison once she, when she gets to be 42 years old. 42 years old. That's when she will come home again after killing the son of the judge. And obviously, you know, she thought after cooling down, because one thing that you truly learn while working the jail system, that one should never, ever make any decisions based on a heated mind. If you are in a fight, if you are in some sort of a problem and you are, your mind is seated, do not make any decisions because there is a high probability that you will regret the decision you have made. Cool down first. And unfortunately, lots of people, they cool down after they made the mistake and they're able to analyze what they have done. And for this young girl, she analyzed that if she had not drank, if she had went home instead, she would probably cry her eyeballs from the eye socket for two or three weeks or three months. She will be depressed, but then she'll get over, find another boyfriend, and life will go on. But she threw 23 years of her life in the garbage for acting in a state of despair. And that state of despair comes from our point of view, our world view, the way we see ourselves, the way we see other. So the spiritist philosophy, this body of knowledge, does not claim to be the only right philosophy, not at all. But it definitely gives us a point of view that is incompatible with other points of view about life. And one thing that explains to you very clearly, to all of us, is that we are not victims. We are not victims. So if we're not victims, what is the alternative of being a victim? Well, the alternative of being a victim is being responsible. And what is to be responsible? You know, this word, its etymology, it's very interesting because what you have here, it's a conjunction of two words. Response with able. Being responsible means you're able to give a response. You are able to respond to a situation in which manner you prefer. So the Spiritist philosophy teaches us that instead of I look for outside sources for the cause of my pain, for the cause of my misery, I should look inside instead. And what I would find if I make a careful analysis of myself are the emotions, are my characteristics that actually is responsible for my pain. In question 919 of the Spirit's book, Alan Kardec wisely asked one of the most important questions that we should ask ourselves. What is the most efficient way to better ourselves, to improve ourselves, and to resist the draw of negativity, the draw of problems? And some people would say the draw of evil, which does not refer to an entity per se, because that doesn't exist. There is no such a thing as a devil, uh, a being created by the supreme intelligence devoted solely to do bad things for eternity. That doesn't exist. What do exist is uh, are temporarily individuals who are making mistakes and they do evil things, but they're not evil people. 
it's the is the result of their ignorance, is the result of their lack of knowledge. So what is the most efficient way to improve ourselves and to resist doing bad things, things that harms us in the process? And the answer, it's quite astounding. It says, a sage of antiquity has told you, know yourself. Now, the answer is very profound as well, because it refers to a sage of antiquity. What that means, if one knows this answer since antiquity, we already know what to do for a long time. And what the sage of antiquity has told us, and they're referring to Socrates, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher, is that one should know ourselves. One should know who we are. And there is a tendency to know other people. We might know who our ex-boss was. We might know who our ex-wife, ex-husband, ex-lover. We might know who our neighbor is, our relatives, but we ignore who we are. And there is there's a reason for that. There is a specific reason why we ignore ourselves. And I'll explain uh, in our later comment. But to know who we are, and it, that in itself makes us think, why in the world to know who, who we are, it's the best way to improve ourselves? Well, the answer is very logical. How can I fix something that I don't know it's broken to begin with? Like the car analogy. How can I fix my car if I don't know what is broken in the car? If I believe that the problem is with the battery and I keep changing the alternator, I will continue having problems. So it's paramount to know what is the cause of the problem. So the best way to improve ourselves is to know who we are. So instead of looking on the outside, Instead of pointing fingers at others, the wisest thing someone can do is to actually look at themselves to see what is it about their personality, about their character, that causes their problem. And if one make this self-analysis, one might find that jealousy is responsible for our pain, for our misery. Resentment could be responsible for our misery. Greed could be a source of our pain. Laziness, envy, and the list goes on. And if I'm able to give a response to this problem, it means I'm able to change the course of the solution. And when I have the courage, when I have the wisdom, when I have the strength, to see myself as being responsible. One cannot be weak and at the same time find ourselves to be responsible. It takes so much strength, so much courage, determination to see ourselves as being responsible. And once we have the wisdom of seeing ourselves as being responsible, something amazing changes. And that is we become powerful. And why? Well, let's go back here to the victim uh, analysis and see why victims are weak. Victims blame others for their pain, for their misery. And because they blame others, the cause of their pain are outside individuals. And the question is, if they are the cause for that person, they're also the solution. Can a victim tell these people to change in order for the victim's life to improve? Can the, can the victim do that? No, the answer is no. I mean, verbally, they can. Verbally, they can say, you know what? You're my ex-husband. I want you to change. Or you're my ex-boss. I want you to change. They can verbally express what they want. But will these people change? Obviously not. And that's why victims are weak because there's nothing they can do to make the other person change because people don't change for other people. People do change for themselves. 
Now, why responsible individuals are powerful? Well, that's because if I am the cause of my problem, who is the solution to my problem? I am. I am the cause, therefore, I am the solution. And most important thing is, can I tell myself what to do? Of course I can. Can I obey myself? Of course I can. On the other hand, as a victim, who is the cause of my problem? They are. Outside individuals. Who is the solution? Well, psychologically speaking, to me as a victim, they are the solution. Can I tell these people to change? No, I can't. Will they change for me? No. Will they obey me? Probably not. Most certainly not. As a responsible person instead, am I the cause of my problem? Yes, I am. Can I tell myself what to do? Yes, I can. Can I obey myself? Yes, I can. Now, it is clear then that there's all to gain by being responsible. But the question is, if it is so good being responsible, why people choose to be victims instead? Well, that's because to be responsible, that requires energy. It's an effortful position to be in. One must make sacrifices within ourselves. That requires work. Being a victim, on the other hand, it's very easy. All I have to do is pointing fingers at people. But being responsible, that requires work. That requires energy for me to change. And obviously, if you have thought about the dynamics of human behavior, you have asked yourself, you know, when will people change? Now, there are different sources of pain when it comes to uh, human dynamics, human personality. To be who we are, especially if we're a victim, that causes pain. It's a painful situation. No victims are happy. They're miserable because they're victims. Usually, lazy people label work, label effort, as being something painful because they don't see what is the true objective here. What is the aim, which is to uh, be a better individual and also to enjoy the fruit of your own effort. Therefore, that's not a painful experience, but an opportunity for growth. Whenever we are invited by life, to overcome our own limits, we label the effort of moving from point A to point B pain. So change requires pain for some people. Change requires work. So when do people change? Well, when the pain of being the same actually gets more intense, it's bigger. Than the, than the pain of change. If the pain of change is bigger than the pain of remaining the same, people don't change. And the spiritist philosophy has a brilliant way to explain the purpose of pain. Pain, it's not an act of God to inflict pain on people uh, randomly. Pain is what we feel when we are stubborn, when we don't understand, when we are ignorant. That causes our misery. But once we understand, once we know the objective, the aim, then we change our point of view. And that changes the way we feel about the transformation we have to make. It changes the way we see the effort because now we won't see it as pain, but rather an investment in our happiness. An investment in our happiness. 
So to be practical here, let me explain to you just one of the causes of pain here, because obviously our time is very short. My good friend Stephen, I believe he gave me until uh, 315. And uh, let's discuss first uh, on resentfulness, for example. What is to feel resentful, resentment, being resentful, having resentfulness? Well, that's when I carry grudges within myself. Someone has done something, something wrong, and I keep the memory of what this person did very much alive in my mind. And I say to myself, I hate this individual. And when I have this resentfulness within me, wherever I go, I carry the resentfulness within me. There used to be a very famous show here in the U.S., the Oprah Winfrey Show, and she had different guests. And one day she had this guest that she was by the side of the road. Someone came in, uh, um, beat her up, did all sorts of, of bad things to this woman. And uh, this person actually thought that he killed this woman and left her on the side of the road. After a couple of hours of being unconscious, she was able to drag herself out of the woods and, and she was able to reach the road again and plead for help. And they rescued her and she was in for therapy for a, a good time, physical therapy because she had broken bones. It was terrible. So when Oprah Winfrey did a show with her, she asked this lady a question, you know, how do you feel today about what happened to you? You know, it, it must be awful. And this woman wisely answered, what that man did to me, he did it that day. What I think about it, it's completely up to me. That is such a wise answer. What he did to me was that day. What I think about afterwards, it's completely up to me. So I'll give you another practical example. If someone came up to you five years ago and they punched your face, maybe you were not able to control this person's arm. Maybe you're not able to control this person's attitude and it was out of your control to, to get punched. But on the following day, it's completely up to you how you feel about this situation. And the way you feel about it, you can give this other person complete control over your life or you could give yourself control. It all depends on your point of view because you are able to respond to this situation. Response is up to you. If you allow yourself to be consumed by hatred for, for what this individual has done, all you're doing, you're just giving this person the power to control you. This person who already proved that they don't like you, maybe they're sick in their mind. Only unhappy people likes to inflict pain, likes to make other people unhappy. So you have this miserable individual who wants to make you miserable. And if you allow this by consuming the hatred, by feeding the negative memory that you have of that moment, wherever you go, you could be in a tropical paradise and here you are behind the bars of resentfulness, of hatred. So you're able to give a response. You're able to tell yourself to digest the emotions of anger that you experienced by reaffirming to yourself that you would not allow the sick individual to tell you how to live your life. Because remember, if you hate the individual, all you're doing, you're just giving control of this individual to control your life. By you digesting the information, by you understanding that your constant memory of what took place is a way of you to keep yourself behind the par bars of resentfulness, you will free yourself from it. Because whenever that negative memory comes to your mind, you're not going to dwell on it. Now, this is a whole seminar uh, that one 
describe, one analyzes what is forgiveness, which is the remedy to resentfulness. And forgiveness, it's not what people think. Uh, forgiveness is not to forget. Uh, to forget, uh, that would um, actually make one believe that to forgive, we should develop a brain disease like Alzheimer's. Uh, to the sick individual who harmed you so you're able to give a response you know i am more important if this individual didn't care about me i must care about myself and i would not allow myself to be in this customized prison of hatred and then we move forward we're able to give a response and in that way we are always in control of ourselves and the same goes for the other char uh, human characteristics, uh, human passions, uh, human flaws, uh, jealousy, envy, laziness, greed, uh, uh, arrogance, uh, the mother of all these uh, imperfections, uh, selfishness. And by understanding that we are able to give a response, we're able to overcome ourselves. We're able to always be in control no matter what. You're able to live with difficult people because you're not allowing them to control you. You're not drinking the poison expecting the enemy to die because you understood that by experiencing these emotions, by maintaining, by feeding these emotions, you are drinking the poison expecting something to happen with your so-called enemy. So the Spiritist philosophy is a great source of knowledge in order for one to learn about ourselves, to learn about our emotions. It tells us that our destiny is perfection. We are constantly growing. We are constantly in the pro in the, under the process of evolution. And not only our biological machines are in the process of evolution, but also the mind the spirit, the driver within this biological car. Everything is evolving in the universe. So what we see as trials, hardships, difficult people in our lives, by reading the uh, Spirit's book, by understanding Spiritism, one gathers the, the, the profound knowledge that these are opportunities for growth, these are the conditions that we need in order to blossom as better individuals that lie within us. And it's completely up to us to make the effort. And if we don't do this through the process of self-love, pain would definitely do its job. Now, what is self-love? Self-love is not necessarily to buy ourselves expensive things. Now, if that was true, rich people wouldn't kill themselves. And unfortunately, uh, statistically speaking, things to ourselves meant that we were happy, we would never achieve the epitome of feeling miserable, which is suicide. Self-love is actually choosing what is best for us. Choosing what is best for us. And when I had the self-love, I would do the things that would actually help myself to improve. For example, you know, spiritism does not condemn anything. It explains. And some people have the habit of smoking. And is it a sin to smoke? It's not necessarily a sin. It's not a wise thing to do. I don't know about in Ireland, but here in the U.S., thankfully, cigarettes have become very expensive. And uh, if someone smokes a pack of cigarette per day, in some states, that could be even $10 per day. That's $70 per week. That's $280 per month. So one can think of making an investment to get lung cancer that costs me $280, $280 to get lung cancer. Lung cancer comes for free. 
I don't have to actually pay for it. So it's not a wise thing to smoke. So if I have self-love, I will not smoke, not because I'm afraid of God or, or because I believe it's a sin. It's my intelligence that prohibits me from smoking. Just the same way that our intelligence, it, it's what prohibit us from dumping sand on our car's engine. <clears throat> Who does that? Who actually dump sand on the car's engine? Nobody does because they want to prolong the existence of the car. The same goes with this body. It's a car. It's a biological vehicle. And if I smoke, I am damaging, I am shortening the life of this car. Now, I could exercise self-love and I will quit smoking or, or I won't start to begin with. But if I don't do this on my own, here comes pain. Here comes bronchitis. Here comes asthma. Here comes cancer. And now that I have cancer due to uh, uh, smoking, I will finally quit. And that moment that I finally quit, I would realize that if I had listened to, to love, I wouldn't have to go through this pain to quit. Pain told me exactly what love was trying to say. And because of my stubbornness, I did not want to listen. And uh, my current profession, and I apologize for speaking about me, but uh, the examples I give uh, backs up the theory I present to you. So the current job that I have, uh, I'm a medical uh, social worker, and my job is to assist uh, someone who is dying or the family, the relatives of those who are dying to die peacefully. And uh, I usually tell my friends at work, you know, the doctor, the nurse, that we help them to die pain-free, physical pain, but moral pain, emotional pain, <laughs> there is no medication for that. Uh, and to die in peace has nothing to do with dying physically pain-free. That's a broad term. It's a whole different lecture where peace comes from. But the point I'm trying to get is that it's very painful to watch someone dying from lung cancer. It's terrible uh, that cancer spreads and the individual can't breathe. They feel like they're drowning. It's, it's an awful thing to watch. And awful, and even more awful, is to realize they know they made a mistake. They were stubborn. And then when you talk to wives, they, are, you know, they tell with so much anger, I told him to quit so many times, and he didn't listen. Sometimes the mother is still alive, and the mother says, you know, my entire life I told my son to, to quit smoking, and he didn't. And now they have to go through this process, very painful process. Now, no experience is ever lost because the individual, the spirit, who is transitioning to the other spirit, to, to the spiritual plane, to the other side of life, through the process of, of lung cancer, is learning from that lesson. Pain is teaching them what love uh, could not achieve. So that way, my friend, by knowing this, by being responsible, we would not allow pain to arrive to teach us by through a constant self-analysis, by a process of self-study, we will be uh, making little improvements every day to avoid pain and to finally experience what we all crave for, peace and happiness. Peace comes from the fulfillment of our obligation. And one of those obligations is to take care of ourselves. So we're able to provide a response in everything that happens in our lives by taking care of ourselves. I thank you so much for your devoted attention. Wow. Thank you very much, Julio. Very inspiring and very, I would say the word is awakening. Uh, let me see here. If you do have I'm so sorry, Stephen. Is this the time you planned? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have a question here for you, Julio. Okay. 
it's from Roberta. Uh, Julio, can you please explain why it's hard to identify a clearly that we are playing the victim role until someone comes to you and says that? Well, uh, to explain the, the uh, answer uh, clearly, uh, I have to, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. I, I thought you, you didn't hear what I said. Okay, no, I did. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, to, to give a full uh, explanation of this question, it would actually be a repeat of the entire lecture. Uh, it would be a repeat of the entire lecture uh, because the reason why it's so hard to see ourselves as, a, as being a victim, it's because it's easier for us to see ourselves as being a victim and it causes hard work to change. Uh, for example, let's say I am a jealous individual. And uh, when I am a jealous individual, it means I believe that the person is with me. It's not a person that is with me, but it's a person that belongs to me. For example, my wife, my husband. I believe these people belong to me. Just the same way we refer to objects. We say, you know, this is my phone, my car my camera. But people are not objects. People are people. So when I use this possessive now, now, you know, my wife, my husband, I believe they belong to me and they don't. And as a result, I develop jealousy. I have this sense of insecurity. I believe that they could be lost at any moment. They could run away. And as a result, I will try to uh, encapsulate them in my personal jail. You know, I would not even allow this person to breathe. I won't allow them to have friends of the opposite sex wherever they go. You know, they must tell me where they're going. And now with technology, there are so many different apps that you can actually know the exact location of, of where the other person is. So it's very sickening. And, yeah. and if they arrive late from, from their job, I got my mind spinning 180 miles per hour thinking of all the persons they could be with because they're not home yet. So it's a very sickening state of mind to be in. So if I am that person, what I would say to myself is to claim that I am not a jealous person. I'm actually a protective person. And why is that? Well, that's because being protective, it has a positive connotation. I am protecting my wife. I am protecting my husband. No, I'm not jealous. And, and why do I sugarcoat this um, trait of my personality? Well, that's because being protective doesn't require any change because I'm doing a good thing. But if I see myself as being a jealous individual, now I know that requires change. And the question is, do I want people to control my life? Do I want people to control where I go and the way I breathe? No, I don't. Therefore, why am I doing to this other person? And I know this argument is not enough. But an argument that actually gets people thinking is that the more we try to put someone in our personal prison, the more they will escape through our fingers because you cannot watch someone 24 hours. We were naturally born free. And when someone takes their freedom away, they are not bringing us closer to them. They are pushing us away from them. So as, I'm, as if I am a jealous individual and I'm thinking about these things, I would certainly see that this trait of mine is not helping me. It's actually pushing those who I love away. And depending on the level of jealousy, I must find psychotherapy. I must do treatment in order to resolve uh, where this jealousy comes from. Now, maybe this could be something from my from my childhood. Maybe as a boy, you know, I was only five years old and I was very attached to my mother, and suddenly she died, and now I developed this. Uh, misconstrued perception of reality that whenever I am close to someone that I care, they could simply disappear. 
So now that I'm a teenager, I'm attached to my girlfriend. And when I'm an adult, I'm, a, I'm really attached to my wife. And that causes so much pain for, for the lover because they cannot, you know, they might like me, they might love me, but they actually enjoy their freedom. So if I do this, I am not doing something constructive for my relationship. So if I'm a jealous individual, it's easier for me to say, oh, no, you know, I'm just being protective and she is out all the time. She doesn't obey me. So it's her fault. Hmm. And when I say it's her fault, who has to change? She does. So the main question that this um, viewer asked was, you know, why is it so hard for us to see ourselves as being a victim? Well, that's because uh, when I say, you know, this is my problem, I am the cause. Now I have to change and that requires work. And do people want to use any energy, any work to change themselves? Most people don't. So this is why it's preferable. It's easier. It's convenient to see ourselves as being a victim. Wow. Oh, that's amazing, Julio. Yeah, because we always we always want to blame someone. We always want to, to put our decisions in someone. Uh, it's 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 kind of tricky. We need to work with um, action and reaction. We are responsible for our action, whatever, whatever it takes. Agreed. It's big. Okay, uh, my dear friend, it's it's our time is up, but I want to say thank you very much for this enlightenment speech, this enlightenment talk for us. Uh, it's very inspiring. I hope everyone see these again because it's not it's not something we will learn we will we, we, uh, uh, work ourselves in just what one hour speech no it's it, this is to be seen every single day as many times as you need to um but julio and i i like to say again so let's work again to 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 have you here with us a, another day and um, in name of uh, SSI, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for uh, all these, uh, let's say, organization, like leaving the kids, wife, all these things to, to be here because everybody is working from home. Yeah? And we have the kids jumping, up, jump, jumping everywhere, coming everywhere. So thank you. Uh, and uh, if I if I can ask you something, can I ask you to do a final prayer for us? No problem. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So to all our friends from the Spiritist Society of Ireland, thank you so much for your attention. All the listeners through different vehicle of communication that has shared this information, thank you so much. So now we ask the Supreme Intelligence of the universe to give us all the wisdom that we must have to improve our, our lives, to give us the courage that we must need in order to overcome our own weaknesses, our own imperfections. Help us to be better husbands, better wives, better friends, so we can do our small part in making this world a better place for all of us. So be it. Okay. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, uh, America. Thank you, Ireland. Thank you, Kardec Radio. And um, we finish our broadcasting today. And I'll see you again next Tuesday at 7.15 Ireland and 2.15 in America. Okay. Thank you, Julio.